Chapter Eight of the House of Cobwebs and Other Stories by George Gissing. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A charming family. I must be firm," said Miss Shepperson to herself as she poured out her morning tea with tremulous hand. I must really be very firm with them. Firmness was not the most legible characteristic of Miss Shepperson's physiognomy. A plain woman of something more than thirty, she had gentle eyes, a twitching forehead, and lips ever ready for a sympathetic smile. Her attire, a little shabby, a little disorderly, well became the occupant of furnished lodgings at twelve and sixpence a week in the unpretentious suburb of Acton. She was the daughter of a Hammersmith draper, at whose death, a few years ago, she had become possessed of a small house and an income of forty pounds a year. Her two elder sisters were comfortably married to London tradesmen, but she did not see very much of them, for their way was not hers. And Miss Shepperson had always been one of those singular persons who shrink into solitude the moment they feel ill at ease the house which was her property had until of late given her no trouble at all it stood in a quiet part of hammersmith and had long been occupied by good tenants who paid their rent fifty pounds with exemplary punctuality repairs of course would now and then be called for and to that end miss shepperson carefully put aside a few pounds every year unhappily the old tenants were at length obliged to change their abode the house stood empty for two months it was then taken on a three years lease by a family named rymer really nice people said miss shepperson to herself after her first interview with them mr rymer was in the city mrs rymer who had two little girls lived only for domestic peace she had been in better circumstances but did not repine and forgot all worldly ambition in the happy discharge of her wifely and maternal duties a charming family was miss shepperson's mental comment when at their invitation she had called one sunday afternoon soon after they were settled in the house and on the way home to her lodgings she sighed once or twice thinking of mrs rymer's blissful smile and the two pretty children. The first quarter's rent was duly paid, but the second quarter day brought no cheque, and after the lapse of a fortnight Miss Shepperson wrote to make known her ingenuous fear that Mr. Rymer's letter might have miscarried. At once there came the politest and friendliest reply. Mr. Rymer wrote his wife, was out of town and had been so overwhelmed with business that the matter of the rent must altogether have escaped his mind he would be back in a day or two and the cheque should be sent at the earliest possible moment a thousand apologies for this unpardonable neglect still the cheque did not come another quarter day arrived and again no rent was paid it was now a month after christmas and miss shepperson for the first time in her life found her accounts in serious disorder this morning she had a letter from mrs rymer the latest of a dozen or so all in the same strain i really feel quite ashamed to take up the pen wrote the graceful lady in her delicate hand what must you think of us I assure you that never, never before did I find myself in such a situation. Indeed, I should not have the courage to write at all, but that the end of our troubles is already in view. It is absolutely certain that in a month's time Mr. Rymer will be able to send you a cheque in complete discharge of his debt. Meanwhile, I beg you to believe, dear Miss Shepperson, how very very grateful i am to you for your most kind forbearance another page of almost affectionate protests closed with the touching subscription ever yours sincerely and gratefully adelaide rymer but miss shepperson had fallen into that state of nervous agitation which impels to a decisive step 
she foresaw the horrors of pecuniary embarrassment. Her faith in the Rymer's promises was exhausted. This very morning she would go to see Mrs. Rymer, lay before her the plain facts of the case, and with all firmness, with unmistakable resolve, make known to her that, if the arrears were not paid within a month, notice to quit would be given, and the recovery of the debt be sought by legal process. Fear had made Miss Shepperson indignant. It was wrong and cowardly for people such as the Rymers to behave in this way to a poor woman who had only just enough to live upon. She felt sure that they could pay if they liked, but because she had shown herself soft and patient, they took advantage of her. She would be firm, very firm. So, about ten o'clock, Miss Shepperson put out her best things and set out for Hammersmith. It was a foggy, drizzly, enervating day. When Miss Shepperson found herself drawing near to the house, her courage sank, her heart throbbed painfully, and for a moment she all but stopped and turned, thinking that it would be much better to put her ultimatum into writing. Yet there was the house in view, and to turn back would be deplorable weakness. By word of mouth she could so much better depict the gravity of her situation. She forced herself onwards. Trembling in every nerve, she rang the bell, and in a scarce audible gasp she asked for Mrs. Rymer. A brief delay, and the servant admitted her. Mrs. Rymer was in the drawing-room, giving her elder child a piano lesson, while the younger, sitting in a baby chair at the table, turned over a picture-book. The room was comfortably and prettily furnished. The children were becomingly dressed. Their mother, a tall woman of fair complexion and thin, refined face, with wandering eyes and a forehead rather deeply lined, stepped forward as if in delight at the unexpected visit and took Miss Shepperson's ill-gloved hand in both her own, gazing with tender interest into her eyes. "'How kind of you to have taken this trouble! You guessed that I really wished to see you. I should have come to you, but just at present I find it so difficult to get away from home. I am housekeeper, nursemaid, and governess all in one. Some women would find it rather a strain, but the dear tots are so good, so good.' "'Sissy, you remember Miss Shepperson? Of course you do. "'They look a little pale, I'm afraid. Don't you think so? "'After the life they were accustomed to. But we won't talk about that. "'Tots, school time is over for this morning. "'You can't go out, my poor dears. Look at the horrid, horrid weather. "'Go and sit by the nursery fire and sing Rain, Rain, Go Away.' "'Miss Shepperson followed the children with her look as they silently left the room. She knew not how to enter upon what she had to say. To talk of the law and use threats in this atmosphere of serene domesticity seemed impossibly harsh. But the necessity of broaching the disagreeable subject was spared her. "'My husband and I were talking about you last night,' began Mrs. Rymer, as soon as the door had closed, in a tone of the friendliest confidence. "'I had an idea. It seems to me so good.' "'I wonder whether it will to you. "'You told me, did you not, that you live in lodgings and quite alone?' "'Yes,' replied Miss Shepperson, struggling to command her nerves and betraying uneasy wonder. "'Is it by choice?' asked the soft-voiced lady, with sympathetic bending of the head. "'Have you no relatives in London? "'I can't help thinking you must be very lonely.' It was not difficult to lead Miss Shepperson to talk of her circumstances. A natural introduction to the announcement which she was still resolved to make with all firmness. She narrated in outline the history of her family, made known exactly how she stood in pecuniary matters, and ended by saying, "'You see, Mrs. Rymer, that I have to live as carefully as I can. The house is really all I have to depend on, and—' and again she was spared the unpleasant utterance with an irresistible smile and laying her soft hand on the visitor's ill-fitting glove mrs rymer began to reveal the happy thought which had occurred to her 
in the house there was a spare room why should not miss shepperson come and live here live that is to say as a member of the family nothing simpler than to arrange the details of such a plan which of course must be strictly business-like though carried out in a spirit of mutual goodwill a certain sum of money was due to her for rent suppose this were repaid in the form of board and lodging which might be reckoned at should one say fifteen shillings a week at midsummer next an account would be drawn up in a thoroughly business-like way and whatever then remained due to miss shepperson would be paid at once after which if the arrangement proved agreeable to both sides it might be continued cost of board and lodging being deducted from the rent and the remainder paid with regularity every quarter miss shepperson would thus have a home a real home with all family comforts and mrs rymer who was too much occupied with house and children to see much society would have the advantage of a sympathetic friend under her own roof the good lady's voice trembled with joyous eagerness as she unfolded the project and her eyes grew large as she waited for the response miss shepperson felt such astonishment that she could only reply with incoherencies an idea so novel and so strange threw her thoughts into disorder she was alarmed by the invitation to live with people who were socially her superiors on the other hand the proposal made appeal to her natural inclination for domestic life it offered the possibility of occupation of usefulness moreover from the pecuniary point of view it would be so very advantageous but she stammered at length when mrs rymer had repeated the suggestion in words even more gracious and alluring but fifteen shillings is so very little for board and lodging oh don't let that trouble you dear miss shepperson cried the other gaily in a family so little difference is made by an extra person i assure you it is a perfectly business-like arrangement otherwise my husband who is prudence itself would never have sanctioned it as you know we are suffering a temporary embarrassment i wrote to you yesterday before my husband's return from business when he came home i learnt to my dismay that it might be rather more than a month before he was able to send you a cheque i said oh i must write again to miss shepperson i can't bear to think of misleading her then as we talked that idea came to me as i think you will believe miss shepperson i am not a scheming or a selfish woman never never have i wronged any one in my life this proposal i cannot help feeling is as much for your benefit as for ours doesn't it really seem so to you suppose you come up with me and look at the room it is not in perfect order but you will see whether it pleases you curiosity allying itself with the allurement which had begun to work upon her feelings miss shepperson timidly rose and followed her smiling guide upstairs the little spare room on the second floor was furnished simply enough but made such a contrast with the bedchamber in the acton lodging-house that the visitor could scarcely repress an exclamation mrs rymer was voluble with promise of added comforts she interested herself in miss shepperson's health and learnt with the utmost satisfaction that it seldom gave trouble she inquired as to miss shepperson's likings in the matter of diet and strongly approved her preference for a plain nutritive regimen from the spare room the visitor was taken into all the others and before they went downstairs again mrs rymer had begun to talk as though the matter were decided you will stay and have lunch with me she said oh yes indeed you will i can't dream of your going out into this weather till after lunch suppose we have the tots into the drawing-room again i want them to make friends with you at once i know you love children oh i have known that for a long time miss shepperson stayed to lunch she stayed to tea when at length she took her leave about six o'clock 
the arrangement was complete in every detail. On this day week she would transfer herself to the Rymer's house and enter upon her new life. She arrived on Saturday afternoon and was received by the assembled family like a very dear friend or relative. Mr. Rymer, a well-dressed man, polite, good-natured, with a frequent falsetto laugh, talked over the teacups in the pleasantest way imaginable, not only putting Miss Shepperson at ease, but making her feel as if her position as a member of the household were the most natural thing in the world. His mere pronunciation of her name gave it a dignity, an importance quite new to Miss Shepperson's ears. He had a way of shaping his remarks so as to make it appear that the homely, timid woman was, if anything, rather the superior in rank and education, and that their simple ways might now and then cause her amusement. Even the children seemed to do their best to make the newcomer feel at home. Sissy, whose age was nine, assiduously handed toast and cake with a most engaging smile, and little Minnie, not quite six, deposited her kitten in Miss Shepperson's lap, saying prettily, "'You may stroke it whenever you like.' Miss Shepperson, to be sure, had personal qualities which could not but appeal to people of discernment. Her plain features expressed a simplicity and gentleness which more than compensated for the lack of conventional grace in her manners. She spoke softly and with obvious frankness. Nor was there much fault to find with her phrasing and accent. Dressed a little more elegantly, she would in no way have jarred with the tone of average middle-class society. If she had not much education, she was altogether free from pretense, and the possession of property, which always works very decidedly for good or for evil, saved her from that excess of deference which would have accentuated her social shortcomings. Undistinguished as she might seem at first glance, Miss Shepperson could not altogether be slighted by any one who had been in her presence for a few minutes, and when, in the course of the evening, she found courage to converse more freely, giving her views, for instance, on the great servant question and on other matters of domestic interest, it became clear to Mr. and Mrs. Rymer that their landlady, though a soft-hearted and simple-minded woman, was by no means to be regarded as a person of no account. The servant question was to the front just now, as Mrs. Rymer explained in detail. She, of course, kept two domestics, but was temporarily making shift with only one, it being so difficult to replace the cook who had left a week ago. Did Miss Shepperson know of a cook, a sensible, trustworthy woman? For the present, Mrs. Rymer, she confessed it with a pleasant little laugh, had to give an eye to the dinner herself. "'I only hope you won't make yourself ill, dear,' said Mr. Rymer, bending towards his wife with a look of well-bred solicitude. "'Miss Shepperson, I beg you to insist that she lies down a little every afternoon.' She has great nervous energy, but isn't really very strong. You can't think what a relief it will be to me all day to know that someone is with her. On Sunday morning all went to church together. For, to Mrs. Rymer's great satisfaction, Miss Shepperson was a member of the Orthodox community and particular about observances. Meals were reduced to the simplest terms. A restful quiet prevailed in the little house. In the afternoon, when Mrs. Rymer reposed, Miss Shepperson read to the children. She it was who, the servant being out, prepared tea. After tea, Mr. and Mrs. Rymer, with many apologies, left the home together for a couple of hours, being absolutely obliged to pay a call at some distance, and Miss Shepperson again took care of the children till the domestic returned. After breakfast the next day, it was a very plain meal, merely a rasher and dry toast, the lady of the house chatted with her friend more confidentially than ever. Their servant, she said, a good girl, but not very robust, naturally could not do all the work of the house, 
and by way of helping, Mrs. Rymer was accustomed to see to her own bedroom. "'It's really no hardship,' she said in her graceful, sweet-tempered way, "'when once you're used to it. In fact, I think the exercise is good for my health, but, of course, I couldn't think of asking you to do the same. No doubt you will like to have a breath of air, as the sky seems clearing.' what could miss shepperson do but protest that to put her own room in order was such a trifling matter that they need not speak of it another moment mrs rymer was confused vexed and wished she had not said a word but the other made a joke of these scruples when do the children go out asked miss shepperson do you take them yourself oh always almost always I shall go out with them for an hour at eleven. And yet, she checked herself with a look of worry, oh dear me, I must absolutely go shopping, and I do so dislike to take the tots in that direction. Never mind, the walk must be put off till the afternoon. It may rain, but... Miss Shepperson straightway offered her services. She would either shop or go out with the children, whichever Miss Rymer preferred. The lady thought she had better do the shopping, so her friend's morning was pleasantly arranged. In a day or two things got into a happy routine. Miss Shepperson practically became nursemaid, with the privilege of keeping her own bedroom in order and of helping in a good many little ways throughout the domestic day. A fortnight elapsed, and Mrs. Rymer was still unable to suit herself with a cook, though she had visited, or professed to visit, many registry offices and corresponded with many friends. A week after that subject of the cook had somehow fallen into forgetfulness, and indeed a less charitably disposed observer than Miss Shepperson might have doubted whether Mrs. Rymer had ever seriously meant to engage one at all. The food served on the family table was of the plainest, and not always superabundant in quantity. But the table itself was tastefully ordered, and indeed no sort of carelessness appeared in any detail of the household life. Mrs. Rymer was always busy, and without fuss, without irritation. She had a large correspondence, but it was not often that people called. No guest was ever invited to lunch or dinner. All this while the master of the house kept regular hours, leaving home at nine and returning at seven. If he were out after dinner, which happened rarely, he was always back by eleven o'clock. No more respectable man than Mr. Rymer. None more even-tempered, more easily pleased, more consistently polite and amiable. That he and his wife were very fond of each other appeared in all their talk and behavior. Both worshipped the children, and in spite of that trained them with a considerable measure of good sense. In the evenings Mr. Rymer sometimes read aloud, or he would talk instructively of the affairs of the day. The more Miss Shepperson saw of her friends, the more she liked them. Never had she been the subject of so much kind attention, and in no company had she ever felt so happily at ease. Time went on, and it was near midsummer. Of late Mrs. Rymer had not been very well and once or twice Miss Shepperson fancied that her eyes showed traces of tears. It was but natural that the guest, often preoccupied with the thought of the promised settlement, should feel a little uneasy. On June 23rd Mrs. Rymer chose a suitable moment, and with her most confidential air invited Miss Shepperson to an intimate chat. "'I want to explain to you,' she said, rather cheerfully than otherwise, the exact state of our affairs. I am sure it will interest you. We have become such good friends, as I knew we should. I shall be much easier in my mind when you know exactly how we stand. Thereupon she spoke of a certain kinsman of her husband, an old and infirm man, 
whose decease was expected if not from day to day at all events from week to week the event would have great importance for them as mr rymer was entitled to the reversion of several thousands of pounds held in use by his lingering relative now let me ask you a question pursued the lady in friendship's undertone my husband is quite prepared to settle with you to-morrow he wishes to do so for he feels that your patience has been most exemplary but as we spoke of it last night an idea came to me i can't help thinking it was a happy idea but i wish to know how it strikes you on receiving the sum due to you you will no doubt place it in a bank or in some way invest it suppose now you leave the money in mr rymer's hands receiving his acknowledgment and allowing him to pay it with four per cent interest when he enters into possession of his capital mind i only suggest this not for a moment would i put pressure upon you if you have need of the money it shall be paid at once but it struck me that knowing us so well now you might even be glad of such an investment as this the event to which we are looking forward may happen very soon but it may be delayed how would you like to leave this money and the sums to which you will be entitled under our arrangements from quarter to quarter to increase at compound interest let us make a little calculation miss shepperson listened nervously she was on the point of saying that on the whole she preferred immediate payment but while she struggled with her moral weakness mrs rymer anxiously reading her face struck another note i mustn't disguise from you that the money though such a small sum would be useful to my husband poor fellow he has been fighting against adversity for the last year or two and i'm sure no man ever struggled more bravely you would never think would you that he is often kept awake all night by his anxieties as i tell him he need not really be anxious at all for his troubles will soon come to an end but there is no more honourable man living and he worries at the thought of owing money you can't imagine how he worries then to tell you a great secret a change came upon the speaker's face her voice softened to a whisper as she communicated a piece of delicate domestic news my poor husband she added cannot bear to think that when it happens who well, he may be in really straitened circumstances and i may suffer for the lack of comforts to tell you the whole truth dear miss shepperson i have no doubt that if you like my idea he would at once put aside that money to be ready for an emergency so you see it is self-interest in me after all her smile was very sweet but don't judge me too severely what i propose is as you see a really very good investment is it not miss shepperson found it impossible to speak as she wished and before the conversation came to an end she saw the matter entirely from her friend's point of view she had in truth no immediate need of money and the more she thought of it the more content she was to do a kindness to the rymers while at the same time benefiting herself that very evening mr rymer prepared a legal document promising to pay on demand the sum which became due to miss shepperson to-morrow with compound interest at the rate of four per cent while signing this he gravely expressed his conviction that before michaelmas the time for payment would have arrived but if it were next week he added with a polite movement towards his creditor i should be not a bit less grateful to our most kind friend oh but it's purely a matter of business said miss shepperson who was always abashed by such expressions to be sure murmured mrs rymer let us look at it in that light but it shan't prevent us from calling miss shepperson our dearest friend the homely woman blushed and felt happy towards the end of the autumn when the domestic crisis was very near the servant declared herself ill and at twenty-four hours notice quitted the house 
As a matter of fact, she had received no wages for several months. The kindness with which she was otherwise treated had kept her at her post thus long, but she feared the increase of work impending and preferred to go off unpaid. Now, for the first time, did Mrs. Rymer's nerves give way. Miss Shepperson found her sobbing by the fireside, the two children lamenting at such an unwonted spectacle. Where was the new servant to be found? In a day or two the monthly nurse would be here, and must, of course, be waited upon, and what was to become of the children? Miss Shepperson, moved by the calamitous situation, entreated her friend to leave everything to her. She would find a servant, somehow, and meanwhile she would keep the house going with her own hands. Mrs. Rymer sobbed that she was ashamed to allow such a thing, but the other, braced by a crisis, displayed wonderful activity and resource. For two days Miss Shepperson did all the domestic labor. Then a maid, of the species known as general, presented herself, and none too soon, for that same night there was born to the Rymers a third daughter. But troubles were by no means over. While Mrs. Rymer was ill, very ill indeed, the new handmaid exhibited a character so eccentric that, after nearly setting fire to the house while in a state of intoxication, she had to be got rid of as speedily as possible. Miss Shepperson resolved that, for the present, there should be no repetition of such disagreeable things. She quietly told Mrs. Rymer that she felt quite able to grapple with the situation herself. Impossible, cried the master of the house, who, after many sleepless nights and distracted days, had a haggard, unshorn face, scarcely to be recognized. I cannot permit it. I will go myself. Then, suddenly turning again to Miss Shepperson, he grasped her hand, called her his dear friend and benefactress, and with breaking voice whispered to her, I will help you. I can do the hard work. It's only for a day or two. Late that evening, he and Miss Shepperson were in the kitchen together. The one was washing crockery, the other, who had been filling coal scuttles, stood with dirty hands and melancholy visage, his eyes fixed on the floor. Their looks met. Mr. Rymer took a step forward, smiling with confidential sadness. "'I feel that I ought to speak frankly,' he said, in a voice as polite and well-tuned as ever. "'I should like to make known to you the exact state of my affairs.' "'Oh, but Mrs. Rymer has told me everything,' replied Miss Shepperson, as she dried a teacup. "'No, not quite everything, I'm afraid.' He had a shovel in his hand, and eyed it curiously. "'She has not told you that I am considerably in debt to various people, and that, not long ago, I was obliged to raise money on our furniture.' Miss Shepperson laid down the teacup and gazed anxiously at him, whereupon he began a detailed story of his misfortunes in business. Mr. Rymer was a commission agent. That is to say, he was everything and nothing. Struggle with pecuniary embarrassment was his normal condition, but only during the last twelve months had he fallen under persistent ill luck and come to all but the very end of his resources. It would still be possible for him, he explained, to raise money on the reversion for which he was waiting, but of such a step he could not dream. It would be dishonesty, Miss Shepperson, and, how unfortunate, I have never yet lost my honour. People have trusted me, knowing that I am an honest man. I belong to a good family, as no doubt Mrs. Rymer has told you. A brother of mine holds a respected position in Birmingham, and, if the worst comes to the worst, he will find me employment. But, as you can well understand, I shrink from that extremity. For one thing, I am in debt to my brother, and I am resolved to pay what I owe him before asking for any more assistance. I do not lose courage. You know the proverb, lose heart, lose all. 
I am blessed with an admirable wife, who stands by me and supports me under every trial. If my wife were to die, Miss Shepperson, he faltered, his eyes glistened in the gas. But no, I won't encourage gloomy fears. She is a little better today, they tell me. We shall come out of our troubles and laugh over them by our cheerful fireside. You with us, you, our dearest and staunchest friend. Yes, we must hope, said Miss Shepperson, reassured once more as to her own interests. For a moment her heart had sunk very low indeed. We are all doing our best. You above all, said Mr. Rymer, pressing her hand with his coal blackened fingers. I felt obliged to speak frankly, because you must have thought it strange that I allow things to get so disorderly. Our domestic arrangements, I mean. The fact is, Miss Shepperson, I simply don't know how I am going to meet the expenses of this illness, and I dread the thought of engaging servants. I cannot, I will not, raise money on my expectations. When the money comes to me, I must be able to pay all my debts and have enough left to recommence life with. Don't you approve this resolution, Miss Shepperson? Oh, yes, indeed I do replied the listener heartily. And yet, of course, he pursued, his eyes wandering, we must have a servant. Miss Shepperson reflected, she too with an uneasy look on her face. There was a long silence, broken by a deep sigh from Mr. Rymer, a sigh which was almost a sob. The other went on drying her plates and dishes, and said at length that perhaps they might manage with quite a young girl who would come for small wages. She herself was willing to help as much as she could. "'Oh, you shame me, you shame me,' broke in Mr. Rymer, laying a hand on his forehead and leaving a black mark there. "'There is no end to your kindness. But I feel it as a disgrace to us, to me.' that you, a lady of property, should be working here like a servant. It is monstrous, monstrous. At the flattering description of herself, Miss Shepperson smiled. Her soft eyes beamed with the light of contentment. Don't give a thought to that, Mr. Rymer, she exclaimed. Why, it's a pleasure to me, and it gives me something to do. It's good for my health. "'Don't you worry. Think about your business, and leave me to look after the house. I'll be all right.' A week later Mrs. Rymer was in the way of recovery, and her husband went to the city as usual. A servant had been engaged, a girl of sixteen, who knew as much of housework as London girls of sixteen generally do. At all events she could carry coals and wash steps, but the mistress of the house, it was evident, would for a long time be unable to do anything whatever. The real maid of all work was Miss Shepperson, who rose every morning at six o'clock and toiled in one way or another till weary bedtime. If she left the house, it was to do needful shopping, or to take the children for a walk. Her reward was the admiration and gratitude of the family. Even little Minnie had been taught to say, at frequent intervals, I love Miss Shepperson because she is good. The invalid behaved to her as to a sister, and kissed her cheek morning and evening. Miss Shepperson's name being Dora, the baby was to be so called, and, as a matter of course, the godmother drew a sovereign from her small savings to buy little Miss Dora a christening present. It would not have been easy to find a house in London in which there reigned so delightful a spirit of harmony and kindliness. "'I was so glad,' said Mrs. Rymer one day to her friend, the day on which she first rose from her bed, "'that my husband took you into his confidence about our affairs. Now you know everything, and it is much better. You know that we are very unlucky.' but that no one can breathe a word against our honour. This was the thought that held me up through my illness. In a very short time all our debts will be paid, every farthing, 
and it will be delightful to remember how we struggled and what we endured to keep an honest name. Though, she added tenderly, how we should have done without you I really cannot imagine. We might have sunk, gone down. For months Mrs. Rymer led the life of a feeble convalescent. She ought to have had change of air, but that was out of the question, for Mr. Rymer's business was as unremunerative as ever, and with difficulty he provided the household with food. One gleam of light kept up the courage of the family. The aged relative was known to be so infirm that he could only leave the house in a bath-chair. Every day there might be news even yet more promising. Meanwhile, the girl of sixteen exercised her incompetence in the meaner departments of domestic life, and Miss Shepperson did all the work that required care or common sense, the duties of nursemaid alone taking a great deal of her time. On the whole, this employment seemed to suit her. She had a look of improved health, enjoyed more equable spirits, and in her manner showed more self-confidence. Once a month she succeeded in getting a few hours' holiday, and paid a visit to one or the other of her sisters. But to neither of them did she tell the truth regarding her position in the house at Hammersmith. Now and then, when everyone else under the roof was asleep, she took from a locked drawer in her bedroom a little account book, and busied herself with figures. This she found an enjoyable moment. It was very pleasant indeed to make the computation of what the Rymers owed to her, a daily growing debt of which the payment could now not long be delayed. She did not feel quite sure with regard to the interest, but the principal of the debt was very easily reckoned, and it would make a nice little sum to put by. Certainly Miss Shepperson was not unhappy. Mrs. Rymer was just able to resume her normal habits, to write many letters, teach her children, pay visits in distant parts of London, the care of the baby being still chiefly left to Miss Shepperson, when, on a pleasant day of spring, a little before lunchtime, Mr. Rymer rushed into the house, calling in an agitated voice his wife's name. Miss Shepperson was the only person at home, for Mrs. Rymer had gone out with the children, the servant accompanying her to wheel the baby's perambulator. She ran up from the kitchen, aproned, with sleeves rolled to the elbow, and met the excited man as he descended from a vain search in the bedrooms. "'As it happened,' she cried, for it seemed to her that there could be only one explanation of Mr. Rymer's behaviour. "'Yes, he died this morning, this morning.' They clasped hands. Then, as an afterthought, their eyes fell, and they stood limply embarrassed. "'It seems shocking to take the news in this way,' murmured Mr. Rymer. "'But the relief, oh, the relief! And then I scarcely knew him. We haven't seen each other for years. I can't help it. I feel as if I had thrown off a load of tons. Where is Adelaide? Which way have they gone?' He rushed out again to meet his wife. For several minutes Miss Shepperson stood motionless, in a happy daze, until she suddenly remembered that chops were at the kitchen fire, and sped downstairs. Throughout that day, and indeed for several days to come, Mrs. Rymer behaved very properly indeed. Her pleasant, refined face wore a becoming gravity, and when she spoke of the deceased she called him poor Mr. So-and-so. She did not attend the funeral, for Baby happened to be ailing. But Mr. Rymer, of course, went. He, in spite of conscientious effort to imitate his wife's decorum, frequently betrayed the joy which was in his mind. Miss Shepperson heard him singing as he got up in the morning, and noticed that he ate with unusual appetite. The house brightened. Before the end of a week, smiles and cheerful remarks ruled in the family. Sorrows were forgotten, and everybody looked forward to the great day of settlement. It did not come quickly. In two months' time, Mr. Rymer still waited upon the pleasure of the executors, but he was not inactive. 
His brother at Birmingham had suggested an opening in that city, thus did Mrs. Rymer phrase it, and the commission agent had decided to leave London as soon as his affairs were in order. Towards the end of the third month, the family was suffering from hope deferred. Mr. Rymer had once more a troubled face, and his wife no longer talked to Miss Shepperson in happy strain of her projects for the future. At length, notice arrived that the executors were prepared to settle with Mr. Rymer, yet, in announcing the fact, he manifested only a sober contentment, while Mrs. Rymer was heard to sigh. Miss Shepperson noted these things, and wondered a little, but Mrs. Rymer's smiling assurance that now at last all was well revived her cheerful expectations. With a certain solemnity she was summoned, a day or two later, to a morning colloquy in the drawing-room. Mr. Rymer sat in an easy-chair holding a bundle of papers. Mrs. Rymer sat on the sofa, the dozing baby on her lap. Over against them their friend took her seat. With a little cough and a rustle of his papers, the polite man began to speak. "'Miss Shepperson, the day has come when I am able to discharge my debt to you. You will not misunderstand that expression. I speak of my debt in money. What I owe to you, what we all owe to you, in another and a higher sense, can never be repaid. The moral debt must still go on, and be acknowledged by the unfailing gratitude of a lifetime. Of a lifetime, repeated Mrs. Rymer, sweetly murmuring and casting toward her friend an eloquent glance. Here, however, resumed her husband, is the pecuniary account. Will you do me the kindness, Miss Shepperson, to glance it over and see if you find it correct? Miss Shepperson took the paper, which was covered with a very neat array of figures. It was the same calculation which she herself had so often made, but with interest on the money due to her correctly computed. The weekly sum of fifteen shillings for board and lodging had been deducted throughout the whole time from the rent due to her as landlady. Mr. Rymer stood her debtor for not quite thirty pounds. "'It's quite correct,' said Miss Shepperson, handing back the paper with a pleased smile. Mr. Rymer turned to his wife. "'And what do you say, dear? Do you think it correct?' Mrs. Rymer shook her head. "'No,' she answered gently. "'Indeed, I do not.' Miss Shepperson was startled. She looked from one to the other, and saw on their faces only the kindliest expression. "'I really thought it came to about that,' fell from her lips. "'I couldn't quite reckon the interest.' "'Miss Shepperson,' said Mr. Rymer impressively, "'do you really think that we should allow you to pay us for your board and lodging, "'you, our valued friend, you who have toiled for us, "'who have saved us from endless trouble and embarrassment? "'That indeed would be a little too shameless.' The account is a mere joke, as I hope you really thought it. I insist on giving you a cheque for the total amount of the rent due to you from the day when you first entered this house. Oh, Mr. Rymer, panted the good woman, turning pale with astonishment. Why, of course, exclaimed Mrs. Rymer. Do you think it would be possible for us to behave in any other way? "'Surely you know us too well, dear Miss Shepperson.' "'How kind you are,' faltered their friend, unable to decide in herself whether she should accept this generosity or not, sorely tempted by the money, yet longing to show no less generous a spirit on her own side. "'I really don't know.' Mr. Rymer imposed silence with a wave of the hand, and began talking in a slow, grave way. Miss Shepperson, today I may account myself a happy man. Listen to a very singular story. You know that I was indebted to others besides you. I have communicated with all those persons. I have drawn up a schedule of everything I owe, and, extraordinary coincidence, 
the sum total of my debts is exactly that of the reversion upon which I have entered, minus three pounds fourteen shillings. Strange, murmured Mrs. Rymer, as if delightedly. I did not know, Miss Shepperson, that I owed so much. I had forgotten items, and suppose, after all, the total had exceeded my resources. That, indeed, would have been a blow. As it is, I am a happy man. My wife is happy. We pay our debts to the last farthing, and we begin the world again, with three pounds to the good. Our furniture must go. I cannot redeem it. No matter. I owe nothing. Our honour is saved. Miss Shepperson was aghast. But, Mrs. Rymer, she began, this is dreadful. What are you going to do? Everything is arranged, my dear friend, Mrs. Rymer replied. My husband has a little post in Birmingham, which will bring him in just enough to support us in the most modest lodgings. We cannot hope to have a house of our own, for we are determined never again to borrow, and, indeed, I do not know who would lend to us. We are poor people, and must live as poor people do. Miss Shepperson, I ask one favour of you. Will you permit us to leave your house without the customary notice? We should feel very grateful. Today I pay Susan and part with her. Tomorrow we must travel to Birmingham. The furniture will be removed by the people who take possession of it. Miss Shepperson was listening with a bewildered look. She saw Mr. Rymer stand up. "'I will now,' he said, "'pay you the rent from the day—' "'Oh, Mr. Rymer!' cried the agitated woman. "'How can I take it? How can I leave you penniless? I should feel it a downright robbery, that I should.' "'Miss Shepperson!' exclaimed Mrs. Rymer in soft reproach. "'Don't you understand how much better it is to pay all we owe, even though it does leave us penniless? Why, even darling baby,' she kissed it, "'would say so if she could speak, poor little mite. Of course you will accept the money. I insist upon it. You won't forget us. We will send you our address, and you shall hear of your little godchild.' Her voice broke. She sobbed, and rebuked herself for weakness, and sobbed again. Meanwhile, Mr. Rymer stood holding out banknotes and gold. The distracted Miss Shepperson made a wild gesture. "'How can I take it? How can I? I should be ashamed the longest day I lived.' "'I must insist,' said Mr. Rymer firmly, and his wife— calm again echoed the words. In that moment Miss Shepperson clutched at the notes and gold, and, with a quick step forward, took hold of the baby's hand, making the little fingers close upon the money. There, I give it to the little Dora, there. Mr. Rymer turned away to hide his emotion. Mrs. Rymer laid baby down on the sofa and clasped Miss Shepperson in her arms. A few days later, the house at Hammersmith was vacant. The Rymers wrote from Birmingham that they had found sufficient, though humble, lodgings and were looking for a tiny house, which they would furnish very, very simply with the money given to baby by their ever-dear friend. It may be added that they had told the truth regarding their position, save as to one detail. Mr. Rymer thought it needless to acquaint Miss Shepperson with the fact that his brother, a creditor for three hundred pounds, had generously forgiven the debt. Miss Shepperson, lodging in a little bedroom, with an approving conscience to keep her company, hoped that her house would soon be let again. End of chapter 8「Nine of the House of Cobwebs and Other Stories」by George Gissing. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Daughter of the Lodge 
For a score of years the Rocketts had kept the lodge in Brent Hall. In the beginning, Rocket was head gardener. His wife, the daughter of a shopkeeper, had never known domestic service, and performed her duties at the hall gates with a certain modest dignity not displeasing to the stately persons upon whom she depended. During the lifetime of Sir Henry, the best possible understanding existed between hall and lodge. Though Rocket's health broke down, and at length he could work hardly at all, their pleasant home was assured to the family. And at Sir Henry's death, the nephew who succeeded him left the Rocketts undisturbed. But under his new lordship, things were not quite as they had been. Sir Edwin Shale, a middle-aged man, had in his youth made a foolish marriage. His lady ruled him, not with the gentlest of tongues nor always to the kindest purpose, and their daughter, Hilda, asserted her rights as only child with a force of character which Sir Edwin would perhaps have more sincerely admired had it reminded him less of Lady Shale. While the hall in Sir Henry's time remained childless, the lodge prided itself on a boy and two girls. Young Rocket, something of a scapegrace, was by the baronet's advice sent to sea, and thenceforth gave his parents no trouble. The second daughter, Betsy, grew up to be her mother's help. But Betsy's elder sister showed from early years that the life of the lodge would afford no adequate scope for her ambitions. May Rocket had good looks, what was more, she had an intellect which sharpened itself on everything with which it came into contact. The village school could never have been held responsible for May Rocket's acquirements and views at the age of ten, nor could the high school in the neighbouring town altogether account for her mental development at seventeen. Not without misgivings had the health-broken gardener and his wife consented to May's pursuit of the higher learning, but Sir Henry and the kind old Lady Shale seemed to think it the safer course, and evidently there was little chance of the girls accepting any humble kind of employment. In one way or another she must depend for a livelihood upon her brains. At the time of Sir Edwin's succession, Miss Rocket had already obtained a place as governess, giving her parents to understand that this was only, of course, a temporary expedient, a paving of the way to something vaguely but superbly independent. Nor was promotion long in coming. At two and twenty, May accepted a secretaryship to a lady with a mission concerning the rights of womanhood. In letters to her father and mother she spoke much of the importance of her work, but did not confess how very modest was her salary. A couple of years went by without her visiting the old home. Then, of a sudden, she made known her intention of coming to stay at the lodge for a week or ten days. She explained that her purpose was rest. Intellectual strain had begun rather to tell upon her, and a few days of absolute tranquillity, such as she might expect under the elms of old Brent Hall, would do her all the good in the world. Of course, she added, it's unnecessary to say anything about me to the Shale people. They and I have nothing in common, and it will be better for us to ignore each other's existence. These characteristic phrases troubled Mr. and Mrs. Rocket, that the family at the hall should, if it seemed good to them, ignore the existence of May, was, in the Rocket's view, reasonable enough. But for May to ignore Sir Edwin and Lady Shale, who were just now in residence after six months spent abroad, struck them as a very grave impropriety. Natural respect demanded that, at some fitting moment, and in a suitable manner their daughter should present herself to her feudal superiors, to whom she was assuredly indebted, though indirectly, for the blessings she enjoyed. This was Mrs. Rocket's phrase, and the rheumatic, wheezy old gardener uttered the same opinion in less conventional language. They had no affection for Sir Edwin or his lady, 
and Miss Hilda they decidedly disliked. Their treatment at the hands of these new people contrasted unpleasantly enough with the memory of old times. But a spirit of loyal subordination ruled their blood, and to Sir Edwin at all events they felt gratitude for their retention at the lodge. Mrs. Rockett was a healthy and capable woman of not more than fifty, but not less than her invalid husband would she have dreaded the thought of turning her back on Brent Hall. Rockett had often consoled himself with the thought that here he should die, here amid the fine old trees that he loved, in the ivy-covered house which was his only idea of home. And was it not a reasonable hope that Betsy, good steady girl, should some day marry the promising young gardener whom Sir Edwin had recently taken into his service, and so re-establish the old order of things at the lodge? "'I half wish May wasn't coming,' said Mrs. Rockett, after long and anxious thought. "'Last time she was here, she quite upset me with her strange talk. "'She's a funny girl, and that's the truth,' muttered Rockett from his old leather chair." full in the sunshine of the kitchen window. They had a nice little sitting-room, but this, of course, was only used on Sunday, and no particular idea of comfort attached to it. May, to be sure, had always used the sitting-room. It was one of the habits which emphasized most strongly the moral distance between her and her parents. The subject being full of perplexity, they put it aside and with very mixed feelings awaited their elder daughter's arrival. Two days later a cab deposited at the lodge Miss May, and her dress-basket, and her travelling-bag, and her hold-all, together with certain loose periodicals, and a volume or two bearing the yellow label of Moody. The young lady was well-dressed in a severely practical way. Nothing unduly feminine marked her appearance, and in the matter of collar and necktie she inclined to the example of the other sex. For all that, her soft complexion and bright eyes, her well-turned figure and light, quick movements, had a picturesque value which Miss May certainly did not ignore. She manifested no excess of feeling when her mother and sister came forth to welcome her. A nod, a smile, an offer of her cheek, and the pleasant exclamation, "'Well, good people,' carried her through this little scene with becoming dignity. "'You will bring these things inside, please,' she said to the driver, in her agreeable head voice, with the tone and gesture of one who habitually gives orders. Her father, bent with rheumatism, stood awaiting her just within. She grasped his hand cordially, and cried on a cheery note, "'Well, father,' "'How are you getting on? No worse than usual, I hope?' Then she added, regarding him with her head slightly aside, "'We must have a talk about your case. I've been going in a little for medicine lately. No doubt your country medico is a duffer. Sit down, sit down, and make yourself comfortable. I don't want to disturb anyone. About tea time, isn't it, mother? Tea very weak for me, please.' and a slice of lemon with it, if you have such a thing, and just a mouthful of dry toast. So unwilling was May to disturb the habits of the family, that half an hour after her arrival, the homely three had fallen into a state of nervous agitation, and could neither say nor do anything natural to them. Of a sudden there sounded a sharp rapping at the window. Mrs. Rocket and Betsy started up, and Betsy ran to the door. In a moment or two she came back with glowing cheeks. "'I'm sure I never heard the bell,' she exclaimed with compunction. "'Miss Shale had to get off her bicycle.' "'Was it she who hammered at the window?' asked May coldly. "'Yes, and she was that annoyed. It will do her good. A little anger now and then is excellent for the health.' and Miss Rockett sipped her lemon-tinctured tea with a smile of ineffable contempt. The others went to bed at ten o'clock, but May, having made herself at ease in the sitting-room, sat there reading until after twelve. 
Nevertheless, she was up very early next morning, and before going out for a sharp little walk, in a heavy shower, she gave precise directions about her breakfast. She wanted only the simplest things, prepared in the simplest way, but the tone of her instructions vexed and perturbed Mrs. Rockett sorely. After breakfast, the young lady made a searching inquiry into the state of her father's health, and diagnosed his ailments in such learned words that the old gardener began to feel worse than he had done for many a year. May then occupied herself with correspondence, and before midday sent her sister out to post nine letters. "'But I thought you were going to rest yourself,' said her mother, in an irritable voice, quite unusual with her. "'Why, so I am resting,' May exclaimed. "'If you saw my ordinary morning's work. "'I suppose you have a London newspaper? No? "'How do you live without it? "'I must run into the town for one this afternoon.' "'The town was three miles away, "'but could be reached by train from the village station. "'On reflection, Miss Rockett announced "'that she would use this opportunity "'for calling on a lady whose acquaintance she desired to make, one Mrs. Lindley, who in social position stood on an equality with the family at the hall, and was often seen there. On her mother's expressing surprise, May smiled indulgently. "'Why shouldn't I know Mrs. Lindley? I have heard she's interested in a movement which occupies me a good deal just now. I know she will be delighted to see me. I can give her a good deal of first-hand information, for which she will be grateful.' "'You do amuse me, mother,' she added in her blandest tone. "'When will you come to understand what my position is?' The Rockets had put aside all thoughts of what they esteemed May's duty towards the hall. They earnestly hoped that her stay with them might pass unobserved by Lady and Miss Shale, whom, they felt sure, it would be positively dangerous for the girl to meet.' Mrs. Rockett had not slept for anxiety on this score. Their father was also a good deal troubled, but his wonder at May's bearing and talk had, on the whole, an agreeable preponderance over the uneasy feeling. He and Betsy shared a secret admiration for the brilliant qualities which were flashed before their eyes. They privately agreed that May was more of a real lady than either the baronet's hard-tongued wife or the disdainful Hilda Shale. So Miss Rockett took the early afternoon train and found her way to Mrs. Lindley's, where she sent in her card. At once admitted to the drawing-room, she gave a rapid account of herself, naming persons whose acquaintance sufficiently recommended her. Mrs. Lindley was a good-humoured, chatty woman who had a lively interest in everything progressive, a new religion or a new cycling costume stirred her to just the same kind of happy excitement she had no prejudices but a decided preference for the society of healthy high-spirited well-to-do people miss rockett's talk was exactly what she liked for it glanced at innumerable topics of the advanced sort was much concerned with personalities and avoided all tiresome precision of argument. "'Are you making a stay here?' asked the hostess. "'Oh, I am with my people in the country, not far off,' May answered in an off-hand way. "'Only for a day or two. Other callers were admitted, but Miss Rockett kept the lead in talk. She glowed with self-satisfaction, feeling that she was really showing to great advantage, and that everybody admired her. When the door again opened, the name announced was Miss Shale. Stopping in the middle of a swift sentence, May looked at the newcomer and saw that it was indeed Hilda Shale of Brent Hall. But this did not disconcert her. Without lowering her voice, she finished what she was saying and ended in a mirthful key. The baronet's daughter had come into town on her bicycle, and was declared by the short skirt, easy jacket, and brown shoes which well displayed her athletic person. 
She was a tall, strongly built girl of six and twenty, with a face of hard comeliness and magnificent tawny hair. All her movements suggested vigour. She shook hands with a downward jerk, moved about the room with something of a stride, and, in sitting down, crossed her legs abruptly. From the first, her look had turned with surprise to Miss Rocket. When, after a minute or two, the hostess presented that young lady to her, Miss Shale raised her eyebrows a little, smiled in another direction, and gave a just perceptible nod. May's behaviour was as nearly as possible the same. "'Do you cycle, Miss Rocket?' asked Mrs. Lindley. "'No, I don't. The fact is, I have never found time to learn.' A lady remarked that nowadays there was a certain distinction in not cycling, whereupon Miss Shale's abrupt and rather metallic voice sounded what was meant for gentle irony. It's a pity the machines can't be sold cheaper. A great many people who would like to cycle don't feel able to afford it, you know. One often hears of such cases out in the country, and it seems awfully hard lines, doesn't it? Miss Rocket felt a warmth ascending to her ears, and made a violent effort to look unconcerned. She wished to say something, but could not find the right words, and did not feel altogether sure of her voice. The hostess, who made no personal application of Miss Shale's remark, began to discuss the price of bicycles, and others chimed in. May fretted under this turn of conversation. Seeing that it was not likely to revert to subjects in which she could shine, she rose and offered to take leave. "'Must you really go?' fell with conventional regret from the hostess's lips. "'I'm afraid I must,' Miss Rocket replied, bracing herself under the converging eyes and feeling not quite equal to the occasion. "'My time is so short, and there are so many people I wish to see.' As she left the house, anger burned in her. It was certain that Hilda Shale would make known her circumstances. She had fancied this revelation a matter of indifference, but, after all, the thought stung her intolerably. The insolence of the creature, with her hint about the prohibitive cost of bicycles, all the harder to bear because, hitting the truth, May would have long ago bought a bicycle, had she been able to afford it, Straying about the main streets of town, she looked flushed and wrathful, and could think of nothing but her humiliation. To make things worse, she lost count of time, and presently found that she had missed the only train by which she could return home. A cab would be too much of an expense. She had no choice but to walk the three or four miles. The evening was close. Walking rapidly, and with the accompaniment of vexatious thoughts, she reached the gates of the hall, tired, perspiring, irritated. Just as her hand was on the gate, a bicycle bell trilled vigorously behind her, and from a distance of twenty yards a voice cried imperatively, "'Open the gate, please!' Miss Rocket looked round and saw Hilda Shale slowly wheeling forward, in expectation that way would be made for her. Deliberately, May passed through the side entrance, and let the gate fall too. Miss Shale dismounted, admitted herself, and spoke to May, now at the lodge door, with angry emphasis. Didn't you hear me ask you to open? I couldn't imagine you were speaking to me, answered Miss Rocket, with brisk dignity. I supposed some servant of yours was in sight. A peculiar smile distorted Miss Shale's full red lips, Without another word, she mounted her machine and rode away up the Elm Avenue. Now Mrs. Rocket had seen this encounter and heard the words exchanged. She was lost in consternation. "'What do you mean by behaving like that, May? Why, I was running out myself to open, and then I saw you were there, and of course I thought you'd do it. There's the second time in two days Miss Shale has had to complain about us. How could you forget yourself to behave and speak like that? Why, you must be crazy, my girl. I don't seem to get on very well here, mother, was May's reply. 
The fact is, I'm in a false position. I shall go to-morrow morning, and there won't be any more trouble. Thus spoke Miss Rocket, as one who shakes off a petty annoyance. She knew not that the serious trouble was just beginning. A few minutes later Mrs. Rocket went up to the hall, bent on humbly apologizing for her daughter's impertinence. After being kept waiting for a quarter of an hour, she was admitted to the presence of the housekeeper, who had a rather grave announcement to make. "'Mrs. Rocket, I'm sorry to tell you that you will have to leave the lodge. My lady allows you two months, though, as your wages have already been paid monthly. Only a month's notice is really called for, but I believe some allowance will be made you, but you will hear about that.' The lodge must be ready for its new occupants on the last day of October. The poor woman all but sank. She had no voice for protest or entreaty. A sob choked her, and blindly she made her way to the door of the room, then to the exit from the hall. "'What in the world is the matter?' cried May, hearing from the sitting-room, whither she had retired, a clamour of distressful tongues. She came into the kitchen and learned what had happened. "'And now I hope you're satisfied,' exclaimed her mother with tearful wrath. "'You've got us turned out of our home. You've lost us the best place a family ever had, and I hope it's a satisfaction to your conceited, overbearing mind. If you'd tried for it, you couldn't have gone to work better, and much you care. We're below you, we are. We're like dirt under your feet.' and your father'll go and end his life who knows where, miserable as miserable can be, and your sister'll have to go into service and ask for me. Listen, mother, shouted the girl, her eyes flashing and every nerve of her body strung. If the shales are such contemptible wretches as to turn you out just because they're offended with me, I should have thought you'd have spirit enough to tell them what you think of such behaviour, and be glad never more to serve such brutes. Father, what do you say? I'll tell you how it was. She narrated the events of the afternoon, amid sobs and ejaculations from her mother and Betsy. Rocket, who was just now in anguish of lumbago, tried to straighten himself in his chair before replying, but sank helplessly together with a groan. You can't help yourself, May, he said at length. "'It's your nature, my girl. "'Don't worry. "'I'll see Sir Edwin, and perhaps he'll listen to me. "'It's the women who make all the mischief. "'I must try to see Sir Edwin.' "'A pang across the loins made him end abruptly, "'groaning, moaning, muttering. "'Before the renewed attack of her mother, "'May retreated into the sitting-room, "'and there passed an hour, wretchedly enough, a knock at the door without words called her to supper, but she had no appetite, and would not join the family circle. Presently the door opened, and her father looked in. "'Don't worry, my girl,' he whispered. "'I'll see Sir Edwin in the morning.' May uttered no reply. Vaguely repenting what she had done, she at the same time rejoiced in the recollection of her passage of arms with Miss Shale and was inclined to despise her family for their pusillanimous attitude. It seemed to her very important that the expulsion would really be carried out. Lady Shale and Hilda meant, no doubt, to give the Rockets a good fright, and then contemptuously pardon them. She, in any case, would return to London without delay, and make no more trouble. A pity she had come to the lodge at all. It was no place for one of her spirit and her attainments. In the morning she packed. The train, which was to take her back to town, left at half-past ten, and after breakfast she walked into the village to order a cab. Her mother would scarcely speak to her. Betsy was continually in reproachful tears. On coming back to the lodge she saw her father hobbling down the avenue, and walked towards him to ask the result of his supplication. Rocket had seen Sir Edwin, but only to hear his sentence of exile confirmed. The baronet said he was sorry, but could not interfere. 
the matter lay in lady shale's hands and lady shale absolutely refused to hear any excuses or apologies for the insult which had been offered her daughter it's all up with us said the old gardener who was pale and trembling after his great effort we must go but don't worry my girl don't worry then fright took hold upon may rocket she felt for the first time what she had done her heart fluttered in an anguish of self-reproach and her eyes strayed as if seeking help a minute's hesitation then with all the speed she could make she set off up the avenue towards the hall presenting herself at the servant's entrance she begged to be allowed to see the housekeeper of course her story was known to all the domestics half a dozen of whom quickly collected to stare at her with more or less malicious smiles it was a bitter moment for miss rocket but she subdued herself and at length obtained the interview she sought with a cold air of superiority and of disapproval the housekeeper listened to her quick broken sentences would it be possible may asked for her to see lady shale she desired to to apologize for for rudeness of which she had been guilty rudeness in which her family had no part which they utterly deplored but for which they were to suffer severely if you could help me ma'am i should be very grateful indeed i should her voice all but broke into a sob the ma'am cost her a terrible effort the sound of it seemed to smack her on the ears if you will go into the servants hall and wait the housekeeper deigned to say after reflecting i'll see what can be done and miss rocket submitted in the servants hall she sat for a long long time observed but never addressed the hour of her train went by more than once she was on the point of rising and fleeing more than once her smouldering wrath all but broke into flame but she thought of her father's pale pain-stricken face and sat on at something past eleven o'clock a footman approached and said curtly you are to go up to my lady follow me may followed shaking with weakness and apprehension burning at the same time with pride all but in revolt conscious of nothing on the way she found herself in a large room where sat two ladies who for some moments spoke together about a topic of the day placidly then the elder seemed to become aware of the girl who stood before her you are rocket's eldest daughter oh the metallic voice of lady shale how gratified she would have been could she have known how it bruised the girl's pride yes my lady and why do you want to see me i wish to apologize most sincerely to your ladyship for my behaviour of last evening oh indeed the listener interrupted contemptuously i am glad you have come to your senses but your apology must be offered to miss shale if my daughter cares to listen to it may had foreseen this it was the bitterest moment of her ordeal flushing scarlet she turned towards the younger woman miss shale i beg your pardon for what i said yesterday i beg you to forgive my rudeness my impertinence her voice would go no further there came a choking sound Miss Shale allowed her eyes to rest triumphantly for an instant on the troubled face and figure, then remarked to her mother, "'It's really nothing to me, as I told you. I suppose this person may leave the room now?' It was fated that May Rocket should go through with her purpose and gain her end. But fate alone, which meant in this case the subtlest preponderance of one impulse over another, checked her on the point of a burst of passion which would have startled lady shale and miss hilda out of their cold-blooded complacency in the silence may's blood gurgled at her ears she tottered with dizziness you may go said lady shale but may could not move 
there flashed across her the terrible thought that perhaps she had humiliated herself for nothing. "'My lady, I hope, will your ladyship please to forgive my father and mother? I entreat you not to send them away. We shall all be so grateful to your ladyship if you will overlook. That will do,' said Lady Shale decisively. I will merely say that the sooner you leave the lodge, the better, and that you will do well never again to pass the gates of the hall. You may go. Miss Rocket withdrew. Outside, the footman was awaiting her. He looked at her with a grin, and asked in an undertone, Any good? But May, to whom this was the last blow, rushed past him, lost herself in corridors, ran wildly hither and thither, tears streaming from her eyes, and was at length guided by a maid-servant into the outer air. Fleeing she cared not whither, she came at length into a still corner of the park, and there, hidden amid trees, watched only by birds and rabbits, she wept out the bitterness of her soul. By an evening train she returned to London, not having confessed to her family what she had done, and suffering still from some uncertainty as to the result. A day or two later, Betsy wrote to her the happy news that the sentence of expulsion was withdrawn, and peace reigned once more in the ivy-covered lodge. By that time, Miss Rocket had all but recovered her self-respect and was so busy in her secretaryship that she could only scribble a line of congratulation. She felt that she had done rather a meritorious thing, but, for the first time in her life, did not care to boast of it. End of chapter 9